So welcome to the Leafy Spurge uh, case study. Uh, the title for today's case study is Managing Leafy Spurge on a Southwest Saskatchewan Ranch. And our case study leader is Melanie Toppy with the South of the Divide Conservation Action Program and the Frenchman Wood River Weed Management Area. And my name is Carolyn Gadette, and I'm the manager with the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP, and I'll be moderating this uh, case study. So I'd like to start by stating that we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, we have worked, they have worked to protect uh, these landscapes and the life that these areas sustain. And I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. So before we get to uh, Melanie's introduction, I just wanted to explain how things were going to go today. So Mel will give a presentation about all the aspects that need to be like considered when doing or developing a management plan. And then there will be a time for questions after the presentation. Uh, you can either raise your hand to be called on um, if you want to ask your question verbally. And that raise hand function is under reactions, I think, in your um, in the Zoom window or you can type in your question to the Zoom chat. So after the questions, uh, there'll be a short break and then we'll meet back and then Mel will go over the activity again and then you'll break out into groups. And so to ensure that everyone is getting the most out of the case study, we would really appreciate if you um, actively participated in the breakout rooms um, and then the breakout room discussions will not be recorded. Um, if you if you didn't want to be recorded, then that's kind of why we're not recording it. Um, and then we'll have everyone regroup uh, and uh, discuss what they included in their management plan and do a conclusion in that kind of thing. Um, so then if you're busy and you're just listening and paying attention on the sign while you're working on something, we would appreciate if um, you would actively participate. Like if, you, if you're busy, you can do the, the case study on your own time because everything's being recorded and there's a handout. Um, you probably know this already, um, because you've been through a few of these sessions, but if you want to hide the sessions or the dashboard on the left of your feed loop screen, you can do that. You can also hide the feed loop Q&A and the presence detector that's on the right, um, or you can click full screen in the Zoom window. Um, the Q&A box and the chat box in feed loop will not be moderated, so make sure to put your questions and issues in the Zoom chat box. Um, you can still use like the public group chat for like networking things, but um, we're not going to be uh, watching that. Uh, for those of you who are collecting gamification points, um, the code for the case study this afternoon is February 22. So again, that code is February 22. So you can put that into your um, in the gamification in the dashboard. And so now to introduce our case study leader, uh, Melanie Toppy is a biologist with the South of the, of the Divide Conservation Action Program and the Frenchman Wood River Weed Management Area. Uh, Melanie has two diplomas in fish and wildlife from the Sir Sanford Fleming uh, College School of Natural Resources and a bachelor's degree in biology from Tr Trent University. Um, she has over 15 years experience working in the field of biology with wetlands, waterfowl, fisheries, and species at risk. And Melanie has been working with SODCAP and um, the Frenchman Wood River Weed Management Area uh, for four years in southwestern Saskatchewan. Um, so Mel, if you wanted to uh, start your presentation. All right. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I see some familiar names, which is really awesome. Thanks so much for joining me today. And I'm hoping and thinking we'll all learn a little bit today. And I'm excited to do this with you guys. 
So during my last five years with sod cap and with the weed management area, I've um, had the opportunity to do a lot of invasive weed work as well as species at risk work. And I've had a lot of opportunity to also work with the ranchers in the southwest part of the province, which has been very rewarding. So today we're going to do a case study on managing invasive weeds on a southwest Saskatchewan ranch. Hmm. Uh oh, sorry. There we go. Sorry, learning curve. So today we're going to talk about the ranch. I'll give you a little bit of a background about um, their grazing rotation, its size, the landscape we're dealing with, and we'll also go over some of the species at risk that are on the ranch and other wildlife. We'll also talk about the invasive weeds that, that are there or close to the ranch. And then we'll go through the assignment, present the plan and discussion as Carolyn already mentioned. So this is an air photo of the ranch. As you can see, it's huge. It's over 39,000 acres um, or 61 and three quarter sections. The ranch runs 900 cow-calf pairs. They also run 200 bred heifers, 195 yearlings and 50 bulls. They do their weaning in October and their breeding season is mid-June to mid-August. And on this ranch, they do all year grazing, but they'll also bring in lentil straw. They have some green feed hay and grain, but they also bring it in depending on, of course, the year. Um, so within this presentation, you'll see a lot of photos. Um, most of them are from the ranch or close to the ranch. Um, just so you know that it's kind of a real life thing. I have changed the name of the ranch for privacy reasons. Um, and I'm keeping it as real as possible, but there's going to be some made up stuff. <laughs> so as you can see, their yard site is over here. Hopefully you can see my pointer. So there, there's three houses, uh, the main farm family. There's an extra house for some of their kids are growing up. So they live there and then their farm helper family lives there as well. They have two sets of branding corrals. This one over here on the west by that big wetland is their main branding corrals. So that's where they do the branding with their friends and family, the whole big cultural ordeal. Then there's another set of corrals over here right on the Frenchman River. You can see the Frenchman River runs through like that. And this is where they'll um, brand cattle if they, or not even brand, but tree cattle or sort cattle or whatever when they're on this side of the ranch, depending on the year. There, other than the Frenchman River, there's a couple other streams that run through here. You can see there, um, there's a few ponds, there's Oxbow Lakes. So there's quite a bit of water. Uh, for rounding up cattle, they use mainly dirt bikes and quads. Um, they will often use horses during their main branding event over here. Okay, so this photo is a little grainier than the last one. It, it was given to me by, by the ranchers. So it still gives you an idea of what the ranch looks like. And this is kind of their grazing rotation and how their fences are set up. Um, they have changed, this map's a little older when I first started, from when I first started working with them, but it still gives you an idea of how things work. So in letter A, this is where the cattle are in the spring before branding. So it's kind of got their holding area. So when it comes to branding, they're all kind of in one spot. Then in early summer, they'll move into B. And then from B, they'll go to C. And by the time they get to D, it's, it's fall. And then they move into E and then F. And H is early spring. I is where the yearlings are. J is where the bred heifers are, K is just a hay field, and G is where their bull pasture is. Then all these other paddocks that don't have a letter are generally used for the kids' cattle, the hired man's cattle, or their horses. Um, so the interesting thing is when they move cattle, a lot of times they'll just open gates and they'll let the cattle move on their own. And they do this so that 
um, there's less chaos. And because the area is so big, it just makes it easier on the cattle and it makes it easier on, on the rancher. So they'll open the gate, they'll leave it open for a few days and eventually the cattle make their way through. A lot of the older cows know the drill, so they're smarter than we all think and they'll, they'll go through. All right, so the next few slides I have are of the topography and the landscape of the ranch. And this is just to give you an idea of, of what it looks like. So when you're making a management plan, it's, it's something you need to consider. Um, and on this ranch, because of the huge area that it is, it's got valleys, it's got plateaus, it's got little hills, big hills, cliffs, and, and everything in between. And I've had the opportunity to walk through most of the ranch and um, in my experienced opinion, the pictures of the hills and the coolies don't really um, show you how intense they can be. But let's go through these. So this top right picture here, you can see this is their main cattle herd of cattle. There's some stubble here in the, in the center. The Frenchman River is actually over to the right of this photo. But you can see in the background there, it gets to be some hills. Um, the picture on the top right gives you an idea of coolies, and we'll see this picture again because a lot of this is actually spurge in these coolies. Um, and if you're not experienced in the southwest with some of these coolies, what you don't see is through this vegetation, there's often holes and drops that can be two to three feet deep, and they come on you unexpectedly, and, and they can be pretty dangerous. Then about, whoops, sorry, oh man, along the bottom, we have the Frenchman River. So here you can see the Frenchman River, the river valley edges are from like cliffs to flat to, you know, pretty easy going topography. But you can also see in the background, some of those hills. Okay, so this top left picture is actually where the second set of branding curls are that they, they don't use quite as often. There's an old yard site there. The bridge crosses the Frenchman River. And I'm hoping you can see my mouse, but there's a road back here and it comes along and it goes back over here. So all of this back here is part of the ranch. And I feel like this picture does a pretty good job of showing you how intense those hills are. And the other pictures on this screen, so this one here shows you, again, some of the coolies, the same with this one down here and the one to the right. And the one on the bottom right, corner there, that hill is actually pretty intense. Um, I've had to walk up and down it a few times and uh, it's steep and it's tall. And then they do have teepee rings, lots of history there. So those teepee rings, um, the ranchers are very respectful of that history and they don't like to brag about them. They don't like to talk about them because they want to just leave them be, leave them as they are and, and that's all there is to that. So finally, here we have the top left picture there. It kind of gives you an idea of what the top of some of these hills look like. That top right picture gives you an idea of the, the valleys. And then that bottom picture just shows you there's hills for miles. Um, that's the beauty of the Southwest is when you get to the top of one of those hills, you can see forever. All right. Here we have our soil capability map. So it gives you an idea the ranch is mainly the class five and class six in here. And so class five soils have serious soil or landscape limitations, but they're good for native perennial forages. Class six have naturally sustained grazing capacity, but are capable of only producing native forage plants and also have serious or landscape limitations. Now I do understand that soils get a little more complicated and you have your smaller zones and that sort of thing. But for the purpose of this exercise, we're gonna try and keep it a little simple. And this also to me gives you an idea of the, the topography, right? Like if this soil is only good enough for grazing, then you know there's, because of topography limitations, you know it's got some pretty intense hills. All right. So we're gonna start getting into the species at risk stuff. 
Now, because this ranch is located in the south of the divide area, a lot of it has been mapped by the federal government for critical and important habitat. So I think it's important for, you know, weed management that we know this. So critical habitat is habitat that is necessary for the survival of a listed wildlife species, endangered, threatened. And it's identified as habitat that is needed in a recovery strategy or in an action plan for that species. Important habitat is designated more for species of concern rather than a threatened or endangered species. And species of concern generally don't have a recovery strategy, but they'll often just have a management plan. So here's our first map with important habitat. You can see the ranch outline is that blue, the blue outline. So here is important habitat for the macown or thick-billed longspur, the long-billed curlew, and northern leopard frog. And while these maps are great to show you where there is important habitat, um, and it shows you the importance of the ranch to species at risk, I think you also need to take into consideration that these maps aren't completely accurate. For example, these big wetlands down here, I know that there's frogs down there. And so, I mean, whoever's mapping this, I don't know if they're actually been to the ranch or if they're doing it from a desk, but, but when you have a map and you have access to this kind of map and you're creating a plan, you just need to remember that they're not completely accurate. It gives you a good picture, but again, you might have to go do some ground truthing. Here's critical habitat for the prairie loggerhead shrike and Sprague's pipit. Again, you gotta take it with a grain of salt because it's not going to be completely accurate, but I also believe it does show you when you overlap the two maps, pretty much the whole ranch is covered in some sort of critical or important habitat. So here's some photos of some of the species that other species at risk that have been found on the ranch, these eight, um, and I'm probably missing a couple. These are the ones that I have experienced. So the chestnut collared longspur, barred sparrow, ferruginous hawk, common night hawk, bark bunting, the rattler, little brown bat, and our little badger. These species at risk, um, except for the barn swallow, I found barn swallow on the ranch. Um, but these other ones, there's either the potential of the species being there or they've been observed in a ranch neck close to this ranch that we're talking about. Um, burrowing owl I've seen in a ranch adjacent to this one, red-headed woodpecker, same thing. Um, so just to give you an idea, there's all kinds of species at risk on this ranch. And of course we have other wildlife. So, you know, golden eagle, coyote, different songbirds, sharp-tailed grouse, different deer and waterfowl. Um, actually, when I worked for Ducks Unlimited Canada in 2003 and 2011, I was working on this same ranch um, to do some nest research. So I know there's ducks out there too. Then of course we have pollinators of all kinds. There's turtles out there. There's elk, muskrat, raccoon, antelope, hare, more birds. It's just, I mean, to me, this ranch could be a national park all on its own. It's just got everything. So now that we have an idea of what the ranch kind of looks like, a little bit about their livestock and grazing practices and what wildlife roams around on the ranch, we're going to get into the weeds. And so I'm going to go over four weed species, um, a couple that are a threat to the ranch and a couple that are on the ranch. And I'll briefly just go through their ecology because when managing for weeds, you kind of need to know this stuff. So our first one is Canada thistle. Um, Canada thistle is found in a couple spots along the Frenchman River, but there's not a lot. The concern with this is in, on land adjacent to the ranch crop, there's a lot of cropland and there's a ton of thistles. It's very, it's a, it's a huge issue. So there is the concern that it will become an issue on the ranch. Canada thistle is actually native to Europe and North, North Asia. And from what I've read, it's been in North America since the 1600s. So it's been around for a long time. It can grow up to two meters. It's got those shiny leaves with spikes on the edges and underneath the leaf, 
leaves are fine white hairs. The stems are smooth and the flowers are small and a purplish pinkish color. And with most invasive weeds, it grows along rows, cultivated fields, disturbed areas. Um, it will grow in pastures and it will outcompete native species. And this one spreads by seed. This bottom right picture, um, all the flowers have gone to seed and, and they blow away like a dandelion leaf. And in case you didn't notice, there's actually field bindweed, which is another invasive species in this picture. This picture is not mine. It was not taken on the ranch. It's from canva.com. All right. Our next weed is scentless chamomile. This one has not been found on the ranch, but it is found along some of the roadways that lead into the ranch and some of the trails close by. And it's also a huge issue in one of the towns that are, are near the ranch. So, you know, it's one to watch out for. It's a short-lived plant native to Europe and it can actually be an annual, biannual, or even a short-lived perennial. It reproduces only by seed, but one plant can produce 1 million seeds, and those seeds can survive in the soil for up to 15 years. They do look very similar to a daisy, but generally speaking, the flowers are smaller. And if you look at this middle picture, which is an oxide daisy, and the picture to the right, you can see the leaves are very, very different. So that's your key ID. But I mean, if you find daisy, daisies anyways, it's still something you wanna deal with because it's a noxious weed. And Samus chamomile grows in disturbed areas, roadsides, fields, gravel pits, fence lines, shorelines. Um, it isn't considered to be competitive in a healthy perennial plant com community. So that's kind of a good thing. Um, this plant will cause blistering on livestock, but most livestock avoid it anyways. It will infest your perennial forage crops and it can decrease your crop and pasture yields. Um, scentless chamomile likes high moisture and it's often found near ponds and sloughs and streams and areas that are prone to flooding, which is an issue because as we know, it is more difficult to manage an, a weed along a waterway. Seedlings establish in the fall and the spring and flowering is from May to October. And plants that emerge later in the season, like in the fall and the next year, they'll develop into a larger, more branched plant. So that's something to consider and watch for. All right, now, Russian knapweed. So this one is on the ranch. Um, it's right along the Frenchman River, unfortunately. It's a fairly small patch, but um, it's there. No one really knows how it got there or how long it's been there. So, so that's, in a way, it's a good thing because it hasn't gone crazy and spread it all over the place. It is a very aggressive plant. So, you know, it's still something that is at the manageable stage. Um, it is a perennial and the flowers are pink to purple and they bloom from June to September. And like most weeds, it grows in disturbed areas and grasslands, riparian areas, and it can establish itself in different soil types. It mainly spreads through its roots or its rhizomes, and it also spreads by seeds, and the seeds remain in, can survive in the soil for up to two years. And like I said, it is aggressive and it can be hard to get rid of once it's established. And it can be toxic to horses, but a horse would have to eat 50% of its body weight in within a month. So I don't think it's a huge issue. All right, and the weed of the hour is leafy spurge. Um, leafy spurge has been on the ranch for years and years and years. Um, there's quite a bit of it, and we'll get into that in the next couple of slides. So leafy spurge ID, it's got these greenish yellowish flowers. Um, and also it has a sap like, like a dandelion. So if you break a leaf or a stem, it'll, it'll leak that white milky sap. This plant has a crazy root system. So the roots can spread four and a half meters horizontally and grow nine meters deep. It spreads mainly by the root system, but it can also present, um, produce 130,000 seeds per plant. And when the seed pods are ripe enough, 
they'll explode and they'll shoot seeds up to five meters away. So here we have the ranch again, an air photo, and this kind of gives you an idea of the main spurge areas. So the yellow is spurge, the green is um, the branding corrals and the house, the yard site. This one is actually in the wrong area, but that's okay. Um, the blue is where we've released leafy spurge beetles in the past, and the purple is where the knapweed is. These pinpoints are smaller patches of leafy spurge or knapweed. And then the polygons and lines are where there's a higher concentration of larger patches of spurge, but it's not like that. Those polygons aren't just chock full of spurge. Um, the other thing is, is there could be more spurge out there. I know on this map, I've missed a couple spots because I tried using IMAP invasives and it wasn't working. And so I just created a map on Google Earth. Um, so there's a few spots missing on here, but it, again, for the purposes of this exercise, I think this is good. Um, this one patch over here in the north east corner, I actually came across this summer when I was putting out bird recorders for Versailles Canada. So we didn't even know it was there. And it's just a small patch. Um, and there's very likely other ones like that throughout the area. So we'll go into these a little closer. So here is, so this is where the branding curls are mapped wrong. It should be right here actually. And this is the main branding corral where friends and family come to brand. Um, this was fairly full of spurge and there's actually some up in these coolies as well. And same with here. So there's a lot of patches here, but then what's not on here is mapped into these coolies, there's spurge. Then you have a little patch up here, a little patch down here. And then there's a bunch of spurge following this little valley and into the um, coolies. And this valley is actually a seasonal spring that eventually heads into the Frenchman River. Now, this, this top picture here, it kind of gives you an idea of what some of the little patches are like in the coolies. And then this picture with the cattle, I took from the Brandon Corrals actually looking north, I believe. Um, so you can see the, the spurge goes up into, into the uh, coolies quite nicely. So this picture, the first place uh, we sp sprayed on this project originally was in 2018 and it's right at the Brandon Corrals. So this left picture, you can see where it's outlined in red, there's a kill in the center, there's no kill because they actually completely missed that spot when they sprayed and then a kill on the other side as well. So this picture is actually one I spent, I sent to the applicator and said, dude, what's going on? You missed a whole bunch and it's flat ground. There's no reason for this. But anyways, the second picture is that same site um, the following year. So it was a really good kill. Um, there was a few straggling plants we used toward on for this area. And the issue with this is, is it hasn't been looked at since. So I don't know after 2019, I don't know what it looks like down there. And the reason why we sprayed right at the corrals is because of the high concentration of people coming in, horses, vehicles, you name it. So you have a greater risk of spreading spurge if you don't take care of that first. Okay, so these are the patches that are closer to the river. This is the Frenchman River. There's an oxbow like there, an oxbow like there. So there's quite a bit just along the river itself. Um, this is also where the bridge is in that picture. If you remember when we were looking at the landscape, that's where the bridge is. And this is where that old yard site is. So here, um, we also have a lot of spurge in these coolies. This picture should look familiar, both of these actually. So these pictures are taken in these coolies up here. Um, then here's the yard site. So these are the more north patches in spots with leafy spurge. These ones here are just kind of small patches that were kind of in a random spot. Um, 
The rancher had sprayed this one just because it was right on their cropland and they were spraying anyways. These two patches are right along the main road into the yard site, into the ranch. They're also right next to a little creek that runs here. And then up here, I mean, you can see from this air photo how intense some of this landscape is, but there's quite a bit of spurge up here. It's very difficult to get to. Um, I had hired an applicator to go up there and spray. I don't even know if they did. <laughs> that was a whole big mess, but anyways, um, gives you an idea of what, what we're dealing with. All right, so now that you have an idea of the ranch, the species, and um, you know where the leafy spurge is and the weeds that we wanna manage, we're just gonna start getting into it. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about monitoring. So something I've learned over the years, something I've read a lot about, and something that I really believe in is adaptive management. But it's hard to adapt your management plan without being in the field and without knowing what's going on in the landscape level. And when you're dealing with livestock and species at risk and invasive weeds, you, you need to know what's going on. Um, range assessments are great. They're really good to tell you that you have good rangeland, but it doesn't tell you that you have good long spur habitat, for example, or it doesn't tell you that you um, have too much litter for Sprague's pipit. It gives you an idea of what's going on for your cattle, which is fine. Um, but when you are trying to manage for all these things, you need to make sure that the area you're managing for a long spur doesn't stay in that poor health range for too long. It needs to be moved. And you don't know that unless you're out there doing some sort of monitoring. Um, so you, yeah, so for me, monitoring is a big deal. You wanna look at range health, absolutely, but you wanna compare it to what a species requirement is, how much litter they need, how tall vegetation they need, the shrub community, for example, and that type of thing. All right. So the budget is made up. I don't know what they have for their budget for invasive weeds, but let's say for the sake of this project that we are working on, you have a 20,000 a year budget for five years. So $100,000 total. Um, the ranchers are open to targeted grazing, but only with goats. They don't want sheep. They don't like sheep. Uh, sheep compete with cattle for grass, whereas goats don't compete as much. Uh, with their cattle for, for forage. So goats are fine, but uh, no sheep. They also, they've worked with um, sod cap before, so they are open to working with other conservation groups, um, not all conservation groups. They are not interested in any kind of easement and they are not interested in a long-term project. So 10 years max is kind of what they are looking at. Um, what else? They are in an RM that has a rural municipality that has a weed inspector, um, which could be important for some funding in your weed management plan if that's what you are going to look into. So the assignment is for you in your groups to create a five-year weed management plan. Um, and you need to consider without getting too complicated um, things like species at risk and other weed species that might be a threat, what sort of funding you have available to you through what the ranch's budget is, and then is there anything else, um, anywhere else you can get money for weed management from. And you want to be able to do some monitoring to make sure your range health is staying good and your species at risk habitat is, is staying good and your management plan for the invasive weeds is being effective. You need to remember and take into consideration their grazing rotation, crop production, the creeks and rivers, and you want to be able to update your plan. And so you need to have some adaptive management. Okay, so some of the questions that we're looking for you to answer is, what are your options for controlling weeds? Would you use more than one method? How do they work together? And what's the timing of the methods? So if you're looking at grazing and beetles, would you throw them in all at the same time or <clears throat> would you do beetles first and then graze or graze and then beetles or spraying or whatever you decide? Um, 
And then what can be done to prevent the weeds from spreading? So if you can't manage to spread that money out to manage all the weeds at once, how, what are you gonna do to kind of help prevent the weeds from spreading more? So there is a handout that I provided. So if you scroll down below the description of the uh, case study and you'll see it and you can click and download it and that will help guide you. There's some uh, websites I included on there to help you know, get to some species at risk information, information and that sort of stuff. I will ask you to assign one note taker and one reporter so that when we come back together as a group, that person can report on what you decided as your weed management plan. And, and then we'll come back for a discussion as Carolyn said. Carolyn, um, do you wanna take it from here? Sure, there's um, a few questions in the chat. For sure. Um, so if anyone has any questions about the assignment or about Mel's presentation, please put them in the chat now or you can raise your hand. Like this is the time to ask them. Um, the first is from May. And what is the target outcome? Eradicate all weeds or reduce impact? Um, that I was going to kind of leave up to you. I mean, eradicate all weeds, of course, is the end goal, but with a ranch this size and the amount of weeds and the small budget, I think that it's nearly impossible. So, yeah, as much as you can. <laughs> okay. And then Megan asks, can you talk about the use of beetles a bit? For sure. So uh, we've been putting beetles on the ranch along the river since 2017. Um, when we release beetles, it's 2,500 per site. Um, so over the last five years, I don't know, 2,500 times five or whatever. Um, what we don't know is if there's still beetles there, if they've lasted over the years, no one, I mean, you know how it is with nonprofit organizations, funding is always an issue. So we haven't had the opportunity to go out and monitor for that, which if I had been there one more year, because um, I, I actually at the end of March, I'm done. But anyways, um, that would be something I would love to know is, have the beetles been effective and are they still there? The nice thing is, is there is a collection site right by this ranch that, um, that SODCAP has been able to use. It's not a public collection site, it's just, we know the rancher kind of thing. So we've been able to get very local beetles. I mean, as local as you're going to get. Um, as for their effectiveness, where we, where we have been collecting beetles from, the beetles have been super effective there in a very short amount of time. So I think there is potential there, but <clears throat> again, we haven't been able to monitor it. So I'm not even sure. <laughs> and so for the beetles, um, how much time or cost would you estimate to collect the beetles and release them? That's a great question. So the beetles themselves are free is how we've been working. You, um, to, collect, to collect them, um, the weather has to be nice. You can only collect them in the first couple weeks of July. That's when they're breeding and they're above ground. Um, to collect 2,500 beetles, it would not take you very long. It would take you like an hour, but you have to make sure it's like 24 degrees Celsius or above. It's not too windy. It's not too cloudy. And the nicer the weather, weather the warmer it is, the more beetles will be out. Um, so generally speaking, um, SODCAP and a couple of watershed organizations usually get together for a day or two um, at the Moose Jaw site to collect beetles. And between all of us, you're, we're able to collect like 60,000 beetles in a day. So it's, you know, you're driving time and um, let's say five hours of beetle collection and then you dropping them off and um, bringing them to, usually we bring them right to the site. So another three or four hours. So it depends on how much you're being paid by your organization or if, or if the landowner is gonna put them in the right spots. 
Okay, thank you. Well, there's a question from Jenna. Um, how do you know what you are, how do you know that you are capturing uh, 2,500? Aren't they fairly uh, small? That's a good question. So we have been able to borrow a beetle collection contraption that um, we borrow from uh, Egg Canada. And so you have your nets, you do your sweep, you dump it into this contraption that kind of sorts through some of the insects because when you're sweeping, you're collecting all kinds mm -hmm. of different stuff. So just ants and beetles get through. And then we have like a little measuring cup at the bottom. It's about this big. And so based on what we've learned is it's like uh, a hundred or I forget, there's a measurement though. I forget what it is. It's, I mean, July was a long time ago, <laughs> but it's basically a measurement. So let's say it's 15 milliliter, milliliters is 1500 beetles. It's, it's a rough estimate, but you base it on a measurement. Okay. Oh, May says one CC equals a thousand. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, if there aren't any other questions for Mel, we're going to take a quick uh, bio break for, uh, let's say, seven minutes. We'll come back at 2.10. Um, and then Mel will go over the instructions for the assignment again, and then we'll break you out into your groups. So we'll see you here at 2.10. That was awesome, Mel. Thank you. I always love your presentations. Oh, thank you. Okay, did you just wanna start with the first room and just go in order? Yeah, that sounds great, for okay. sure. So in room one, there was, um, I don't know if it told you what room you were going in, but room one had Diana and Dustin and Jana. Um, who was the reporter for that room? I think, I think that Karen. was Karen Gunther. Yeah, I was lucky. <laughs> Do you want me to just start talking? <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry. Um, can I share my screen? Because we, we did take some notes, so that might be easiest for everyone to see. Yeah. yeah. Is it, can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so the team here can tell me if I've screwed up the priorities here, because initially I said AB, but I think we were focusing on IC and the Cooley systems, and the plants were leafy spurge and Russian knapweed, and primarily leafy spurge just due to the um, amount. Um, the questions were more than one method, and how do they work together? So we'd be spraying large flat areas in the boundaries, grazing coolies with goats and using beetles in existing areas, collecting and redistributing. And spray, we'd use the graze on. It's a broad leaf, excuse my spelling if I got that wrong. Um, we'd wanna spray prior to cattle entering, but understand that um, as long as animals aren't lactating, I believe it was good to use. Um, timing of methods. So basically from years one to five, it's the same thing, except that um, in year two to five, we'd increase our monitoring just to see if our uh, applications of different methods were working. Um, it was tough to do costs because we weren't sure on acres. So we just kind of said $10,000 per year for goats and then the rest of that would be for spray and beetles. We were kind of determining as free because you could get those from the municipality we understood. Um, does anyone else want to say anything?
No, that was it. That was a good kind of a good rundown of, of, of where we were at. Looks good. <clears throat> I mean, it's always better if you have more money, but you know, you, some of the funding for the chemical can come from SARM and yeah, looks good. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, and then in room two, that was like Zoe and Christina's room. Hello. Um, yeah, this was a very fun exercise. I think we uh, quickly got overwhelmed with the um, different management routes that we could go and not knowing the acres. Um, but we wanted to put a focus on uh, leafy spurge and the knapweed. Uh, we noticed that the knapweed was in a winter grazing area. Um, so we felt that that could be controlled with herbicide. We would look at doing that uh, twice in the first year. Um, a spring and fall and then um, again and then in the second year if it seems like it was fairly eradicated we would um, maybe put down some seed um, as well as spraying uh, just depending on the timing um, and if it seems like it, if we could do a fall seeding or waiting until the third year um, and then for spurge we are going to focus um, as much of our efforts in goat grazing um, Originally, we looked at trying to spray out a larger area and then seeding it um, years later and then realized how large the scale was and that there was no way we would have funding for that. Um, and so we would look at goat grazing and using that additional funding from SARM um, to assist with that as well as the herbicide. Um, and we did not, you know, get to year three, four, and five in terms of management, but we recognized that um, doing monitoring, coming in and looking at the sites would be really important to evaluate a plan, but we wanted to do basically a combination of management practices with uh, goat grazing, um, uh, herbicide application, and also reseeding just to try and... Um, and beetles. Decrease and and beetles yes and we also we also talked about beetles so that would be in the those um we originally were saying in the like along the river bank but when we realized that goats could go there then we thought maybe we could try and get them to those um like uh more remote, remote locations that were in smaller patches so that the goats were able to focus on the larger areas and go into the river bank um we did not really fully make a budget, um, but we were going to be using funding from the government. And then if there are conservation districts or watershed districts in the area, perhaps we could also get additional funding for native prairie restoration work as well. Anyone from my group wanna add anything? Nope, you did great. You covered it. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Nice. And I think I think that using the goats along the water and then putting the beetles in those other places is a great idea, which um, to be quite honest, I will mention to whoever takes over my job in April. So that's a pretty great idea. Thank you. Oh, well, good job, team. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and then room three was May and Allison's room. Who is the reporter for that group? Uh, yeah, it's Stephen. I took our notes as we were brainstorming and coming up with a plan. Me and Allison are kind of our leaders. Um, I don't know me if maybe you were, would be better to kind of go over the plan and the discussions and then I could fill in with some of the notes if, um, if you wanted some of the more specifics. Are your notes orderly? Is my head's not very orderly? Well, they're they're not bad. So if you if you think of something you need some uh, some more info on, I can I can provide yeah. it. I guess um, start with goals. We we talked briefly about goals. Um, um, you know, is it possible to eradicate? No. So we want to maybe develop some target uh, targets uh, like uh, stem density of weeds, uh, size of the patch, 
Um, and uh, what was the third one? Was it just monitoring beetles and their well, health? Maybe area, area reduction percent. Yeah, there was area reduction. There was density of stems. I thought there was another one towards the end. I think we kind of just talked about maybe a achiever advocation on a smaller scale, but knock back uh, the densities on the bigger one. I don't really have much more than that. Yeah. Goals Anyways, are, it's, yeah. it's important to focus on goals and, and what your outcomes look like, something measurable, what you'd be measuring in year five. So we talked about that. And then uh, we chose to focus, we, well, we talked about goat grazing but uh, you know, wondering what the cost of that is, uh, I think we understood that it is quite costly to, to do that because um, goats would probably have to be managed uh, so you'd have a contractor in. So we kind of went away from that approach and more towards using leafy spurge flea beetles and, um, and uh, herbicides. So the beetles, we would have focused on the larger patches and uh, we would up the density of them. Like uh, we had something like 20 releases over all of the patches and with some of the smaller patches having two or three, we would augment the beetles at the, at the smaller patches where beetles have already been released. For example, on that large patch in the West, I think we had something like six to eight releases of 2,500 beetles each. And that's just to get things kind of going a little faster than if we just put one release on that big patch and wait. Um, every year we'd come back and monitor those beetles, uh, you know, check on the, the beetle releases would be GPS um, so that we know where to come back to and we check on the beetles, see if they're healthy. And if it's a great population, we would move them around. So it'd be part of our labor activities. Um, getting the beetles, we'd get them from nearby um, at the uh, secret source that was mentioned earlier, uh, but also consider getting ones from other other places because they'd have different genetics, you know, different tendencies to move in different ways and prefer different habitats. So, uh, and then on the smaller patches, like the pinpoints uh, of the spurge, uh, as well as pinpoints where there's a nap weed, uh, we would focus spraying. And uh, we talked a lot about uh, timing of spraying and areas of spraying to avoid um, um, damages to species at risk, but also other wildlife species. Um, we considered spraying in the fall. There's in so, some cases where spraying is, can be effective in the fall, you know, to avoid bird nesting, young, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, one of the limitations of one of the chemicals we were considering, Navius, um, it suggests that uh, we need to put it on to actively growing spurge, which is going to be during the nesting period. Uh, we talked about a lot, quite a bit about budget. Uh, a lot of it is labor uh, because of the leafy spurge beetles. Um, I think we estimated maybe 500 to to $1,000 for chemical just to purchase it, and then a labor again to apply it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, anything else, Stephen? No, you, you definitely covered it. Uh... You covered everything we you know we actually did go a little bit into the math on like how much it would cost you know for to have some summer students out picking up the beetles gathering them releasing them and it um it it wasn't very significant so that still you know left a fair bit of money if we wanted to explore goats or something whatever else we were thinking we also talked about leveraging other dollars in case we wanted to do other things and I, I being from Manitoba I'm not sure what programs were out there but uh, we had some program suggestions that you know we might have a third or half we'd have to pay a third or a half and then the rest gets matched by the government or county or um, some other entity but still like if we're considering uh, grazing like goat grazing it's somebody mentioned maybe 10,000 dollars per year mm -hmm. and I don't know what the scope is of that application like is that all season long or nine months or nine, 90 days or so yeah you'd have we're to still focusing on the beetles and the and the chemical yeah yeah and um the beetles especially 
since I know close by, they've worked really, really well. And uh, I think that we could they, we could up the number of Beatles being released. And um, I mean, they're right there and there's some funding for it. Um, the targeted grazing is, is tough because it is very expensive. So it's anywhere from $650 a day to astronomical prices and $650 a day is like the very, very, very cheapest. Like the, the gentleman who did it for us in the past felt sorry for the landowners because there was so much spurge and it's very conservation minded. And so it's kind of um, as a favor to us and to the landowner, that kind of price. And um, I mean, the number of goats, I'd say on average between three years that he was at our site, it was probably, 450 to 500 goats and they would cover only 10 to 12 acres in a day and you want to do it twice over method so the first time you graze you just skim the flowers off so there's no seed production and then the second time you go through you want to overgraze the spurge um, and it does take a lot of years but um, what's so great about it is those goats can get into those hard to reach places um, you're employing somebody and you know, the, the kids are going to be sold later on. So, I mean, if someone wants a business idea, getting into targeted grazing would be very lucrative, but you need to have the horse and the dogs and all that fun stuff. But yeah, good job. Thank you. Okay, and our last group is room four. And that was Megan's room. Megan, are you the... The reporter? I am the reporter. My video isn't working, so uh, that's okay. Um, there we go. Yeah, okay, so so many good weed management plans already. Um, ours, yeah, I guess right off the bat, we're just going to apply for all funding options. <laughs> so the Canadian Agricultural Partnership had some options, same with SARM. Um, we, yeah, kind of uh, next mowing is an option right off the bat, just for accessibility um, and I guess size of infestation areas. And then we also wanted to stay away from any spring spraying just with, yeah, the species at risk. Um, and then also the migratory birds, um, you're kind of limited there in your window. So we focused on fall spraying. So yeah, I guess year one, um, Russian knapweed, we thought it would be fun just to do some hand pulling. <laughs> it looks like a relatively small area, obviously from what we can tell, kind of accessible. There's a trail close by, maybe loop in um, some of the community, get some school kids in there. That would be sweet. So that was our idea uh, for Russian knapweed. And then the leafy spurge was kind of multi-dimensional. So close to the river um, where you'd introduce beetles before, we didn't want to do any spraying there based on the proximity to the water. So we opted to introduce beetles as well um, in, the, in early July. And uh, yeah, Taylor in our group had a bit more knowledge on the beetles. So she said, takes a while to establish a colony and they also don't spread very readily. So we chose to kind of limit our area of the beetles um, close to the river. And then, uh, yeah, again, throughout the years, it could be an option to kind of pick up and transfer some beetles to some different areas. Um, and then we wanted to spend all the money and uh, do some goat grazing in the big uh, infestation off to the west there by the wetland and we opted not to spray in that area just to try and maintain as much biodiversity as possible so we didn't want to just spray out all of our broad leaves um, so we opted yes to throw some goats in there um, and uh, and then in terms of kind of the smaller areas that are um, maybe a little bit less accessible. We thought a couple options, um, either do some hand spraying kind of via quad in the fall or um, one of the fellows, Derek mentioned 
drone spraying. So I don't know what the distance is um, in terms of range for the drones, but like that could be super cool if you're kind of down on the side of the coolie. Um, again, cost wise, we're not really sure, but we thought uh, if a big ranch isn't gonna try it, then who will? <laughs> so yeah, looked into some options like that. And then just to kind of wrap it up, some mitigation for the branding area to maybe spray down um, the tires before entering that area um, to try and limit, um, yeah, further spread of the weeds. And then, uh, yeah, I guess as we carried on through the years, like kind of just adjusting our practices as we saw fit. Like I liked the idea of introducing the beetles to some of those harder to reach areas. Uh, yeah, I think I got it all. Awesome. And you know, the drone spraying is something that the rancher has talked to me about several times, but the problem we had was it there was no funding that covered it. And so we couldn't, we couldn't afford to do it kind of thing. But uh, the other one too is helicopter spraying. You can get a little better coverage with helicopters, but, uh, and I used to know the cost of that and there's not a lot of people who do it. Um, there's a question, is drone, drone spraying legal? And that was part of the problem is it hadn't been approved yet. So um, I think it would be super cool though. And who knows where, when it'll come. Um, there's something else I wanted to mention. Uh, I forget, but awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I guess there was one other um, Discussion question is, what were some of the difficulties with creating a plan? And, and one thing was, you know, we don't know, I didn't give you the acreage for how much spurge is actually there, which definitely complicates thing, things. But as far as like the planning aspects, like thinking about water and species at risk and all that sort of thing, what was some of the difficulties that you guys had in doing this management plan? Does anybody want to share anything? I'll maybe just pop in quick. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I think, yes, like trying to tailor it, tra tailoring your weed management methods um, based on your critical habitat species at risk, like there's a lot at play there. Um, and again, restricting like what time of year you want to do some of your more invasive methods like weed or um, like spraying. And then, uh, yeah, obviously being restricted, like either even with that west area like you're close to a wetland there so just having that setback for spraying um, and then accessibility is obviously a huge one yeah. for sure thank you anybody else all right maybe i'll pop in with a question what do you think the biggest uh kind of, yeah, um, issue is at hand in terms of coming up with a weed management plan for this site? For me, it's the river because you can't spray right on the river and, and it's a pathway for invading further downstream. And so that, that in any of the kind of weed management situations is the most difficult thing to deal with. Um, you can, you can do goats, um, but some people don't like goats and they're pretty costly. So trying to get someone to understand the cost of having someone else's goats graze on their land is, is very, is very difficult. Cause usually like if you think of a community pasture, um, me as a rancher, I'm paying to let my cows go graze somewhere else. Whereas with targeted grazing, me as the rancher is paying someone else to let their animals on my land to graze. So it's kind of a hard concept to get around. Um, so yeah, rivers, creeks, flowing water, they're difficult. Anything else from anybody? Awesome. I, I hope you guys got stuff out of this. I, I think it was pretty fun, actually. I enjoyed myself. <laughs> Thanks, Carolyn, for having me. Yeah, no, thank you for um, putting all the effort and work and the presentation and developing the case study. 
Um, I think it was awesome. And Saskatchewan's really gonna miss you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna miss Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think the all the management plans, like with the information that they had, um, they came up with good plans. And I mean, that's what management is, right? You have to take what you have, which is sometimes not a lot, not a, not enough information, not enough money and prioritize what you need to do to get, I don't know, to have the most effect, I guess. So, yes. yeah, so that was awesome. Um, so I guess that concludes our case study this afternoon. Uh, you're welcome to go check out the trade show booths and the posters. Um, and we'll see you back in the Habitat session uh, tomorrow morning. So have a good afternoon. And thanks, thanks again. Yeah. Janelle. That was awesome.